Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Anurekha Chariwag. I teach sociology at Savitri Bai Phule Pune University. I am an assistant professor there and I am also coordinating the paper on sociology of India. The first module which is titled Origin, Growth and Institutionalization of Sociology in India has six modules. Within that I am going to discuss the first module which is Sociology, Anthropology and Colonialism in India. The basic idea of this module is to give an understanding to the students that knowledge is very very closely related to the nexus of power and the construction of understanding of society in India and the way sociology in India has been institutionalized has to be understood in an historical context especially with the experience of colonialism. So basically this module would introduce the students to basically three four important areas like one to what extent did the experience of colonialism shape the way practices of knowledge and the discipline of sociology got institutionalized in various disciplines and various departments in India. In this module in order to understand the experience of colonialism we would also try to understand how is the relationship between sociology and anthropology. As you will see drawing from the works of various scholars we will try to understand that the manner in which sociology was introduced and institutionalized draws a lot of, upon the manner in which sociology and anthropology has been perceived globally. The reason why we need to do such a kind of critical analysis of institutionalization of any discipline is, is the fact that in order to understand the way we practice sociology especially in terms of our teaching research and uh, pedagogic practices, it is very important to understand the way we understand each discipline and especially the relationship of sociology and anthropology in India today. Introduction. What does doing sociology refer to? Doing sociology starts with some ideas that strike people and then they seek an explanation for why people believe them and maybe end up with a complex theory of how people think and act. Sociology as a discipline asks oneself to question the way human beings interact, the way they behave. So one needs to stand outside common sense and consider what, why and how people actually act within the larger structures of society. And therefore, it is very important that it is not confused with common sense. As a discipline, sociology pushes us to question what is given so as to recognize that the natural and givens in the society are strongly influenced by historical and social forces. Further, sociology embodies social knowledge and recognizes the fact that social reality is characterized by multiplicity of coexisting and contending paradigms in the social sciences. As a discipline, it is really a critical awareness of social life. And if this is what sociology is all about, then the question is to what extent does the organization of knowledge in the form of disciplines play an important role in shaping the perspective of the discipline itself? Since the late 19th and 20th century, European and American scholars have theorized on the societal changes and evolved frameworks and perspectives to understand the shifts within society. One can argue that the theories and methodologies in sociology has crystallized between 1880 and 1945 in encounters with European experiences of dealing with changes in society following the industrial revolution, the development of capitalism, the experience of wars, the process of colonization and the evolution of modern state. Crudely, one could say that that sociology is thus a reflection of modern societies. It was during the intellectual revolution that one refers to as enlightenment, the change, process and critical thought all combined to lead people to the realization that society, like everything else, was constructed and therefore changeable and could be analyzed. The study, examination and analysis of the modern society was then the focus of sociology as an academic discipline. Since then, these frameworks and perspectives has been scrutinized, evaluated and interrogated from distinct locations as sociology spread across the world. Patel argues that this inheritance has to be assessed to be dominant and Eurocentric both over theories and practices and thus examined as being uneven in a spread and distribution within nation states and regions. This module titled Colonialism, Anthropology and Sociology is the first module within the larger topic of origin, growth and development of sociology in India. This module focuses on the introduction of sociology mediated through the process of colonialism and how that mediation had an impact on the manner in which sociology is practiced in India. Further, 
it has been argued that the institutionalization of sociology into disciplines within academia has been done to legitimize the local frameworks of European and American sociology as universal hegemonic frameworks in order to understand and theorize social reality. This is not to argue that there have been no adaptations of the framework to contextual settings or that there is no critique of these dominant universal paradigms. But what is important is to understand that in many ways the processes of institutionalization of sociology as a discipline can erase the critical perspective embedded within sociology. Oberai et al. argue that while it is true that the practices of anthropology and sociology in India have been shaped by the theories and scholars of the West, especially the process of colonialism, local influences of theoretical institutional and nationalism have played an extremely important role in producing these disciplines. Sundaram, reflecting on the way sociology was introduced within Indian universities, states that the location of sociology was within the transdisciplinary identities during the first half of the century. So it becomes imperative to initiate a debate on the various distinct ways in which power has shaped and continues to shape the practices of sociological knowledge across the world. The module will focus on the writings of scholars who have intervened to discuss the institutional history of sociology in India. It will include an analysis of three interlinked issues. One, debate on social anthropology and sociology. Two, diversity of approaches towards a society in India. And three, what kind of sociology stood sociologists in India practice. This module is structured into four sections, followed by a conclusion. Section 1, colonialism, anthropology, sociology, the contested debate. Section 2, similarity between anthropology and sociology. Section 3, institutionalization of approaches in sociology. And section 4, sociology in post-independence period. Section 1, colonialism, anthropology and sociology, the contested debate. Debate. The major debate structuring the perception towards sociology in India is a debate of relationship between anthropology and sociology, especially in the context of the nature and stated goal of the disciplines themselves. This is especially important in the question of perceiving anthropology and sociology as twin disciplines. It is important to recognize that the question of relationship between sociology and anthropology is a critical point of discussion within academics that have experienced colonialism. Bremen, reflecting on the practices of sociology within the non-Western world, argues that there is a need of meaningful demarcation between sociology and anthropology in terms of conceptual apparatus, theoretical frameworks and research methodologies because earlier demarcations based on dichotomies of modern, traditional, macro, micro and quantitative and qualitative have become irrelevant. Thus the challenge for sociologists and anthropologists is to conduct new demarcations that would stimulate collaboration. Scholars analyzing the disciplinary history of sociology in India contend that the trajectory of sociology in India has to be analyzed through the experience of colonialism. It has been argued and well established that social sciences that were transmitted through the empires of European expansion had the overall effect of colonialism most significantly on the minds of subject people, especially the power and inevitability of Western modernity and its value system. Scholars in different contexts have reflected and theorized on the growth, institutionalization, consolidation and the challenges of teaching and research of sociology in India. Jyotka argues that among many social sciences, sociology in India has been the most reflexive about its practices. One finds vast literature on the emergence of sociology, engagement with colonial encounter, relationship with social anthropology and relation with larger social, political and economic macro structures. This module draws upon some of the works of scholars mentioned and discusses the trajectory of sociology in India, especially the debate of social anthropology and sociology in India. Among the scholars theorizing on the history of sociology in India, there are two groups. One group of sociologists have emphasized the similarity of sociology with social anthropology and the other group of sociologists who have problematized this question within the discourse of academic colonialism and anthropology as a study of other, the East, and sociology as a study of our own societies, the West. The reason has been clearly stated in the words of Andre Bete, who argues that though he perceives himself as a sociologist, he is regarded mainly as an anthropologist in the West, as in the West, it is assumed and accepted that the study of other culture is anthropology and study of ourselves is sociology. Thus, anyone who studies India, Africa is an anthropologist, whereas to be a sociologist, one has to be a specialist in Western industrial society. This disciplinary division relates thus to a discourse of power institutionalized within European modernity 
as argued by Patel. Section 2. Similarity between sociology and social anthropology. The legacy of sociology in India refers to a tradition where it is argued by Indian scholars that there is no difference between the practices of sociology and anthropology. As Rao, a leading sociologist in his overview of the institutionalization of the discipline stated that it is important to note that a sharp distinction between anthropology and sociology did not emerge in India. Srinivas and Panini have stated that Indian sociologists and social anthropologists are unable in their empirical work to distinguish between the two disciplines. Scholars like G.S. Ghure, Radha Kamal Mukherjee, D.N. Manjundar, Iravati Karve, and K. Bose, J.H. Hutton, David Mandelbaum did not also make a clear distinction between sociology and social anthropology. Rao, based on a survey of research in sociology and social anthropology, stated that sociology practiced in the Bombay department included social anthropology and in Calcutta, social anthropology was extended to include sociology. Further, Ghurie, according to Rao, emphasized that in the Indian context, the distinction between anthropology and sociology was artificial. In similar arguments, Srinivas states that the social anthropology is a respected discipline because it gives very crucial experience of intensive fieldwork. Srinivas further believed that the sociology students in India would find it more challenging to study one's own society than that of the other. Thus, they should undergo training in social anthropology for a minimum of two years so as to develop an empirical outlook. For Srinivas, the union of social anthropology and sociology is desirable and will be of advantage to sociology. Thus, Rao states that it is important to note that sharp distinctions between sociology and anthropology did not emerge in India. Rao based his analysis on the observation that G.S. Ghure, K.P. Chattopadhyay and D.N. Majumdar, Dao were trained in anthropology, did researches both among the tribes and castes, subject of interest for anthropologists and on rural and urban settings, subject of interest for sociologists. Patel argues that the divisions between sociology and anthropology were part of a political project of colonialism imbibed in Europe and the West where social science started. The political project, argues Patel, was based on dividing the study of two different societies into two different disciplines. The sociology as a study of us, the modern Western society, and anthropology, the study of other, the non-Western societies. Guha argues that we need to draw a distinction between sociology and anthropology as sociology is an analysis of macrostructures whereas social anthropology is an analysis of microstructures. Such an argument is referred to as a simplistic assertion by Thapan and thus one needs to critically analyze the institutionalization of the disciplines within the colonial encounter. Patel states that since the 1960s, anthropologists, especially from the North, reflecting on the colonial legacy of the discipline, are arguing that the discipline which is organized and institutionalized represented the othering of the East, have defined anthropology as handmaiden of colonialism and a daughter to an era of violence. Asad argues that anthropology is rooted in an unequal power encounter between the West and the Third World, in which Ethnographic and historical knowledge of the colonized domains not only enabled the colonizers to know and administer, but also reinforced the inequalities between European and non-European worlds. Thus, as Patel argues, anthropologists studied the discipline's history in order to understand how anthropological knowledge was increasingly used as a civilizing mission of the colonial authorities and structured through administrative practices. Patel cites Dirks, who has asserted that the colonial conquest was sustained not only by superior arms and military organization, nor by political power and economic wealth, but also through cultural technologies of rule. Anthropology and its knowledge, together with its theories and mythologies, became a part of these processes of rule. And in the words of Levi Strauss, colonized people were treated as mere objects of study. In similar vein, Pathi argues that the origins of the disciplines of anthropology and sociology in India emerged within the colonial milieu to meet the political and administrative needs and then later aided in the expansion and consolidation of the colonies. In this context, Pathi cites Evans Pritchard, if it is the policy of a colonial government to administer a people through their chiefs, it is useful to know who the chiefs are and what are their functions and authority and privileges and obligations are. Also, if it is intended to administer a people according to their own laws and customs, one has to first discover what they are. 
In this way, social sciences are used to understand the manner in which people could be understood and regulated. And thus, as students of sociology, we need to understand that knowledge is socially constructed and historically located, where macro-political economic structures such as colonialism have played an important role in structuring of the discipline. In this context, Deshpande states, to argue that sociology and social anthropology as argued by M. N. Srinivas, are to be united is to erase the historical context that led to the emergence of research and teaching of these disciplines in India. While sociology emerged in the post-enlightenment context of modernity with growing influence of science as a method of knowledge and its application to the study of man, social anthropology grew with the expansion of the colonial empire and became a part of the technologies of the West over the non-West. Engaging with this debate, Bete initially started with arguing that there is no clarity in the conception and usage of sociology and social anthropology in India. Further, it is not possible to have neat definitions as they have the same approach to the study of social life. Their methods of investigation and analysis are similar. This is because the analytical framework, which includes concepts, theories and methods to study of the society and culture in India, was influenced by the West. This is also reflected in G. S. Ghure, the first professor of sociology in Bombay, and K. T. Chattopadhyay, the first professor of anthropology in Calcutta, were trained in Britain. In this context, the arguments of Jodhka are relevant, as he argues that if sociology is the study of the self, that is, advanced industrial societies, and anthropology is the study of other, that is, non-Western, non-industrial societies, then India for sociologists is both self and the other. What does it imply for a sociologist to study society in India? Bethe's argument in this context of insider and outsider are interesting because when one defines oneself as sociologist, it raises important questions of intellectual orientation. One needs to appreciate the validity of a multiplicity of viewpoints to engage with concepts, methods and theories that have their roots in intellectual traditions other than their own and have to reflect from one standpoint. This is important in the context when the development of social anthropology and sociology has not been uniform or uneven in some centers. And the impact of it is the importance of research on India and representation of India, particularly Indian society with all its divisions and subdivisions, currents and countercurrents within a single entity, that of India. The scholars analyzing the history of sociology in India have argued for locating sociology within a larger colonial encounter. Thou sociology as a teaching subject was introduced at 1919 at University of Bombay, one has to trace its trajectory through analyzing the institutionalization of anthropology within India. Thapan, drawing on Bourdieu, argues that the field of power is very closely linked to the creation and establishment of contemporary intellectual fields in India. It is evident that the overall education system that colonial bureaucracy sought to impose on India and that anthropology was introduced by the British colonial government in order to classify, categorize and document the people under its rule. Thou one perceives sociology as a critical inquiry but its disciplinary location within colonial discourses of governmentality has rendered the discipline a bureaucratic enterprise. The Srinivas's argument that the British power was conducive to the growth of sociology and social anthropology as a colonial power had organized the entire subcontinent as a single power needs to be analyzed within the larger nexus of knowledge construction and institutionalization of disciplines within the political project of colonialism. Section 3. Institutionalization of approaches in sociology. If this is the way the discipline of sociology was institutionalized within India, then who were the scholars who through the research and teaching consolidated the discipline? And what were their approaches undertaken by them? And how did it impact the way sociology was structured within India? This impact was perceived in two ways. One, Patel argues was the usage of methodological nationalism and two, institutionalization of upper caste Brahmanical patriarchal approach to the study of society in India. Methodological nationalism, argues Patel, drawing from the works of Eurik Beck, is the approach that assumes that the nation is a natural and important representation of modern society. According to Beck, sociology's visions of culture and politics, law, justice and history represent that of the nation state. Patel argues that sociology practiced in India was closely associated with the official discourses and methods of understanding and that sociology was institutionalized as a sociology of India as Indian society and equated 
the Indian society with the territory controlled by the Indian state. Thus, in this way, the approach was to study the groups and cultures as being unitary and organically linked to territories, thus reproducing the social world as bounded, culturally specific, spatial units was institutionalized. Thapan argues that there was a diversity of approaches that got institutionalized in the study of society in India and these include a variety of approaches and methods. Indological approach which dominated the study in India was practiced by G.S. Ghure, Iravati Karve, Y.B. Damle, D.P. Mukherjee, Louis Dumo, and two interdisciplinary sociology and economics approach R.K. Mukherjee, D.N. Majumdar and three structural functionalism which was practiced by M.N. Srinivas. In this section, using the scholarship and approach of Professor G.S. Ghure, we would analyze briefly what it implied for doing sociology in India. Further, with regard to scholars who framed the sociological discourse in India as upper caste Brahminical and patriarchal approach did not problematize the politics of knowledge construction, categories and methods. Analyzing the work of G.S. Ghure, Upadhyay argues that the frame used by G.S. Ghure was Indological, that is, study of India through scriptures, which consolidated and hegemonized an upper caste view of social categories such as caste in India. In this context, Upadhyay goes on to state that an Indological approach used analysis of cognitive principles that structured Hindu civilization and attempted to describe and collate various customs, practices and rituals associated with Hindu society and presented it as Indian society. Further, Ghuriya and his students documented a number of rituals associated with marriage and kinship within Hindu communities. This documentation, argues Upadhyay, was based on naive empiricism and fact collection where there was no engagement with any theoretical framework including structural functionalism which was highly regarded during this time. As a result of such an approach institutionalized by G.S. Ghure, the father of Indian sociology, sociology in India reflected three dominant trends. One, sociology in India was identified as anthropology. Two, the discipline reflected categories and conceptual frameworks determined by those framed in Europe. And three, trend of affirmation of values of Hinduism as Indian. As Upadhyay argues that the above cultural nationalist perspective made the discipline sociology not only empiricist and politically conservative, but also Brahmanical and Savarna, that is upper caste in its outlook. Section 4. Sociology in India, post-independence period. In the post-independence period, the focus of research was mostly conditioned by the Indian state policy of centralized planning, which needed information for designing policies and in this context, social sciences, especially economics, played an important role. Pathi, using the Marxist perspective, argues that post-independent analysis of process of institutionalization of anthropology in India has to be contextualized within the United States imperialism, where it invested in funding projects to gather data in the third world for its capitalist expansion. To quote Pathi, in fact, anthropologist is an epiphenom of colonialism and its present existence is largely due to neocolonialism, maintenance and conservation of order. In the context of sociology, Pathi argues that it is historically and socially conditioned to meet primarily the needs of capitalist expansion. In neocolonial post-independence times, social science research was much influenced by American sociology. Pathi, using examples of two major research trends, one, village studies and two, caste studies argues that these studies are examples of a historical, mechanistic and positivistic analysis. In particular, village studies sought to maintain in the Indian rural scene by arguing for community development program as an efficient method of rural transformation and thus ignoring the class contradiction represented in the unequal distribution of land. The sociology in the post-independence period was dominated initially by structural functionalism and then later by the modernization theoretical paradigm characterized by historical analysis, a perspective that does not engage with inequalities and do not question power structures. Why does he argue so? Pathi draws from the arguments of D.N. Majumdar, an eminent sociologist who writes, while discussing the role of sociologists in India, that as studying the principles that govern social life, common living, common sharing of social heritage and the continuity of social structure to guide the course of the country whose culture is eternal. Based on such analysis, Pathi argues that what we have as sociology in India is a profession which is based on dominant structural functionalism and has contributed to the growth of middle class perspective in the universities and academic bodies, with exceptions such as D.P. Mukherjee, A.R. Desai, D.T. Kosambi, Ramakrishna Mukherjee, Kathleen Gog, P.C. Joshi and S.A. Dange.
Echoing similarly, Mukherjee, analyzing stages in the historical development of sociology in India, argues that in the period of 1950s and 1960s and 70s, it is a stage of diagnostic sociology, which is based on identifying vulnerable regions of the social structure through which change in the society can be affected. Thus, in the 50s and the 60s, the challenge was to deal with historical non-economic approach of the British and American sociology and imitative of static theories of social system and dynamic theories of change drawn from American theories of change. The larger impact of such perspective was a sociology based on a superficial irrelevant theorizing and applied research. Thapan thus argues that sociology in India has remained a soft discipline where it did not contribute to theoretical developments in the discipline as a whole and thus remains a limited sociology both in substantive content and methods. In similar lines Jyotka argues that analyzing the practices of sociology in India, especially the people who came to occupy positions of power in the university system and the kind of knowledge that they produced about Indian society, that as students of sociology we need to ask ourselves why there was no Muslim, Christian, Dalit or tribal sociologist, with the exception of one upper caste Brahmin woman, Iravati Karve. The leading sociologists were men belonging to upper caste. So what does this reflect on the kind of sociology that was being institutionalized? It is important to understand that Indian sociology framed by these elite sociologists or mainstream sociologists needs to be located and analyzed within this historical social context. Conclusion Reading through the arguments dealt in the module reveal that it is important to understand disciplinary history. As mentioned in the above analysis, sociology is commonly understood to focus on the study of modern industrial societies and anthropology in the study of primitive, tribal or pre-modern societies. The students of sociology should recognize that the history of sociology is linked to the post-independent period of modernity, to the evolution of modern social and political theory and to the development of a scientific approach to the study of man and society. As Madan argues, the prerequisite for building sound disciplinary tradition is informed critique and appreciation of the work of previous generations. Srinivas argued that Colonialism played an important role in the growth of sociology. According to him, British power was conducive to the growth of sociology and social anthropology as for the first time the entire subcontinent was under the control of a single power. Not only were social sciences used as an instrument of social policy, but also increased political consciousness among Indians, the development of self-criticality of the Indian customs and way of life, and systematic analysis of India's past, growth of Western-inspired Indian scholarship, and growth of nationalism, all that have contributed to the growth of social sciences in India. In this context, one could observe that sociology and anthropology in India, thou introduced by the British, also developed its own path. We need to recognize that colonial legacy also had led to the establishment of certain social and cultural societies, nurturing intellectual legacy, thereby drawing our attention to the public culture of sociology in India. Ghosh argues that in Bengal, one could observe that intellectual associations played an important role in institutionalizing sociology and social anthropology. He refers to associations such as Asiatic Society of Bengal, Academic Association, which was a debating club, Society for the Acquisition of General Knowledge, which discussed issues relating to history, geography, language, social conditions, and Tatwa Bodhini Sabha, which discussed social conditions, which he believed were critical to nurturing the disciplines of sociology and social anthropology, particularly in Bengal. Thus, as student of sociology, one needs to recognize and critically evaluate the diverse traditions and intellectual practices that make up the discipline. After discussing the various issues relating to origin, growth and institutionalization of sociology in India, we need to understand there are four or five important issues that need to be focused. First, in order to understand the manner in which sociology was institutionalized in India, we need to understand how the whole experience of colonialism has shaped the way we understand the discipline. Two, we also need to focus on the relationship or the perceived relationship between sociology and social anthropology. Three, we need to be aware of the intersections in terms of institutions, practices and knowledge building processes, especially within the spatial context. Four, we also need to be aware of conducting an historical approach to an understanding of the linkages between the macro and the micro structures. And last but not the least, have an understanding of the manner in which scholars have intervened in shaping of the discipline through the various approaches that they have. For example, if we see sociology in India, the influence of G.S. Khure through an Indological approach has influenced the manner in which sociology was practiced. 
So, in all of this, the important idea or the important issue that we need to take back with us after doing this module is an understanding that knowledge has to be understood within a historical context. Two, there is increasingly great relationship between knowledge making and power, state processes and macro and micro processes. Thank you.